guys, welcome back. Today I'm sharing something with you that I didn't think I would share with you. A drive up to Ophir Canyon. Town of Ophir in Utah is um, a very old mining town that um, now has something like, I don't know, sub 100 residents. I want to say probably sub 50. Past that is a beautiful little campground. Um, it's been a while since I've been up there. I heard that some things have changed up there, so I wanted to kind of take a ride and look around. Ophir Canyon is a place that um, not a ton of people know about, but is really, really nice. Uh, so it was kind of difficult for me to decide to share this with you, but it's appropriate today because there's something else I want to share with you that is also very, very personal. I'm just going to jump into it, tear the Band-Aid off. My sister, my big sister, passed away. She was surrounded by all of her family, myself, all my siblings, my mom, uh, her three kids, and uh, my wife and, you know, a lot of, a lot of others. She was diagnosed with cancer a year and a half or more ago. No, a little less than a year and a half ago. Diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, started getting treated immediately, but it was a very aggressive form of, of, cam of cancer. I think it's called triple negative. We all knew going into it, as did she, that her chances of survival were not very good, but that didn't change her attitude. She was extremely, extremely upbeat about it, extremely optimistic about it, and uh, we gave her all the support we could, all the support she needed as she uh, went through the process of trying to fight it, trying to beat it. She had a mastectomy, had the chemo, had the radiation, had all the, the whole nine yards, and it was pretty painful for her, pretty difficult, but man, what a trooper she was, and she just had an incredibly good attitude uh, throughout the entire ordeal. My sister was one of these people who loved everybody she met, just got to know people so quickly. Who are you? Oh, now you're my best friend. And she was just like, that was just her personality. So anybody, and anybody that met her just loved her for that. You know how magnetic people like that can be. I hope you know that. I hope you know somebody like that. And that was my sister. She was just a magnetic personality who got along with everybody, loved everybody. That's not to say she was a perfect person. I mean, there was a lot of, a little bit of chaos in her life that spilled over into our lives that uh, we, we needed to give her some support for and so forth um, over the years. But uh, we loved her and she loved everybody. But uh, let's check out some of the mining town stuff. Welcome to Ofer. There you go, guys. A little look at what this place looks like. We might uh, drive around and see a little bit of the old buildings. I don't know if I'll take too much of a detour. I really want to get out to the campground to go 20 miles per hour so we'll keep it marginally slow here it's really cool you guys should come up here and explore this place sometime lots of historical uh, stuff to see beautiful buildings again the residents are few and far between but um, the area is just so pretty definitely worth visiting and checking out at some point so we all thought she had the cancer licked at one point she, um, again, finished the, the radiation, the chemo, uh, the surgery, and we thought that things were, you know, looking good. That she was, uh, everything was going to be okay. And we were kind of planning for that, really hoping for that, praying for that, obviously. Um, and then a very short time ago, I want to say a month, a month and a half ago, uh, she discovered that it was back. I remember a phone call that she and I had. She was uh, pretty, pretty frightened, and it was really difficult to hear my sister that scared because, number one, I mean, she and I are close-ish, as close as most of as she is with the rest of the family, but I've never really had that sort of a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with her about anything, and then for her to open up and and become very emotional on the phone with me was difficult to listen to. I mean, I've, I've listened to that from my mom over and over, not to say that my mom's super emotional, um, but you know, my father passed away over two years ago and my mom has needed a ton of emotional support, emotional support since then. So to hear that sort of come from my sister 
was also kind of difficult. When it returned, it was pretty clear, pretty quickly, she wasn't going to survive it. And uh, we all knew that because the recurrence rate for triple negative is very high and survival rate for that kind of recurrence is next to zero. Uh, some of you guys already know about this. A number of you guys follow me closely on Facebook and Instagram where I've posted more information about this than I have here on YouTube. So those of you that do and many of you guys that are my close friends and you know have we all have cell phone numbers and, and chat with each other um, have, you guys have sent me personal message which is messages and text messages which I really appreciate to be dead honest with you it becomes difficult after a while to keep hearing people say the same thing how are you doing how are you holding up um, all that uh, really it's um, it, it's wonderful to hear people uh, wish wish you the best and tell you that uh, that you're in their prayers but it's really tough to have conversations past that um, and those of you who have lost a loved one I think you know what I mean by that that said I've got some friends who have reached out and, and mentioned you know and told their stories about folks that they've lost honestly that is some of the the most therapeutic stuff to hear because I don't know, just commiserating like that and, and sharing experiences like that and, and knowing that somebody else got through it. And in many cases, even harder situations. I mean, people who lost children, that is really, really difficult to hear. But I have friends who've been in that situation as well. And uh, knowing that somebody went through something even harder is um, is very meaningful and it, and it um, it's very helpful to hear some of that. So watching her kids was the hardest part. I don't mean like watching them, like having them over and taking care of them, that's easy to do. I mean watching them suffer and watching them deal with this. Her, um, her younger son, her 17 year old boy, was in so much pain and it was so obvious. And that right there was the hardest part of the whole situation, watching him deal with this. The rest of us had sort of come to terms, but there's no way a 17-year-old boy can really wrap his head around the idea of losing his mother. You know, particularly this guy, you know, somebody who didn't have his dad around for a good portion of his life. For him to now lose the one person who is the anchor in his life just kills me to think about it. On top of that, her five-year-old daughter, who we're still actually trying to figure out what's going to happen with her, meaning I don't know who's taking care of her. I don't know where she's going to live at this point. She could go away with her dad. She could try to live with some of us. My wife and I have put our names into the hat and said, look, we'll, we'll do whatever needs to be done. We'll open up our home to her if that will help. Reach the end of the road faster than I imagined I would. This was a lot shorter. Last time I came up here, I hiked up here. No vehicles beyond this point. I figured I'll scratch the back if I can reach it. Excuse me, guys. Or was I? There are a lot of things left to settle. Got brand new tires on the KLR, by the way. These are Shinko 700s. Yeah, that's right. Shinko 700s, or E700, I think is what they call them. They're about a 60-40 tire, 60 street, 40 trail, which is precisely what I wanted. I want, I'm not going to be doing serious dirt biking at any time soon, and certainly not on this bike. So I wanted something that could handle dirt and gravel easily, but, um, you know, get me up, up some hills and so forth when I feel like it, but primarily just kind of get me around as a commuter and also also as a little fun you know cruising bike been up here several times with the family we love this place life throws, throws curveballs at you and there's certain things that take much much higher priority than the run of the mill than the everyday and for a little while there for a very short period there i thought about trying to maintain my youtube schedule while my sister was dealing with this recurrence 
and I quickly realized that I'm going to be saying goodbye to my sister very soon. I cannot waste this time, you know, making making videos that are ultimately inqu inconsequential. I know some of you guys really appreciate certain videos I've made, and I'm glad for that. And I feel like certain ones have been meaningful, but in the end, none of that matters as much as spending time with family, particularly when that member of my family is about to go. So I guess as like a, a record for posterity or simply a, um, a way of letting you guys know what this experience has been like to go through, I wanted to kind of describe you know what what this was like because this is not easy stuff to witness you know my sister who again one of the most boisterous most friendly happiest people you've ever met still st kept an incredible attitude but towards the end just had no ability to to talk to communicate to really share anything i don't know that i'll take this whole t loop here but uh, i might try some of it My sister went from having a little bit of pain, and this is talking about from the recurrence on, she went from having a little bit of pain and realizing that there was some kind of a lump, some kind of a possible recurrence, then to sort of a, a regular hospital where they had no idea what to do. They, they put her on some kind of a fluid drip and gave her a little bit of pain medication and so forth, but they did not have a clue what to do took her from there she tried to be at home for a little bit but her condition was worsening by the hour so she went up to Huntsman Cancer Center which treated her phenomenally and I just if any of you guys out there ever want to donate some money to a worthy cause don't donate it to people like me please give it to a place like the Huntsman Cancer Center in Salt Lake City Utah these guys <clears throat> they know what they're doing and they just have the right staff, the right place, the right equipment, the right everything to give people like my sister exactly what they need. And that's the comfort and the support. Um, if not to survive, then at least to live through the end of it comfortably. And that's, uh, that's what they did for her and it was wonderful. She was there for a number of days. I think it was uh, Father's Day, actually, that I decided to take the family up there. We pretty much completely gave up on doing anything Father's Day related on Father's Day. And my poor wife had things planned and things she wanted to do for me. Um, but it was far more important that we took care of my sister at that point. And that's what we did. One more word about my amazing wife. She did so much for my sister towards the end. In the last several days, she was there in ways that nobody would ever really want to be. I mean, she treated her so well. She was essentially doing the work of a nurse. And you know, for those of you who are in nursing or know people in nursing, that can be pretty uncomfortable work. Uh, somebody who is not a trained nurse, uh, would and should be pretty uncomfortable doing a lot of that but my amazing wife did such such good for my sister in those last days and hours and I just love her for it so she was at the Huntsman Cancer Center for a while several days and then they needed some kind of progress in, it in order to let her go home but they realized at one point that uh, the progress they were looking for wasn't really wasn't really coming, and so it was it was basically let's let's get her into hospice as quickly as possible. So they did that, got her into hospice at my mom's house, where we were hoping it would be maybe another two weeks, maybe a week, two weeks that we'd be able to have her. The night she passed away, I got there in the early evening. And my wife said, look, uh, the nurse said, she's down to 48 hours max. So at that point, it was all hands on deck. The entire family came to her side and 
I realized fairly quickly, most of us realized fairly quickly that 48 hours was a pipe dream. And it turned out to be four to six hours. So we were there from early evening till early the next morning uh, when she finally passed away around 1.30. I got to give you some kind of a graphic picture though of what that meant and some of you guys might want to avert your ears to understand what it means to be with someone as they're passing away. So she reached a point where she was more or less unresponsive. Now she was on a heck of a lot of pain medication, morphine and everything else. So that played a big part in it but on top of that she was going. She was just going. She had one foot out the door. So there was no more getting her to respond to things. There was no more getting her to um, do things to help us maintain her, her state. It was just us sort of shifting her, moving her, trying to get things into her mouth, trying to wet her lips with a little sponge, trying to look for any sign of communication, any, any sign of consciousness at all, but it kept dipping. It, we kept seeing less and less of that. And as we got closer to the end, her breathing became labored, if you uh, Google a term called, uh, what do they call it? Death rattle. That's what it is. Google death rattle. Essentially, it's, it's when a person can no longer clear their throat, can no longer swallow. In the last several hours, she couldn't swallow or anything. Uh, so she couldn't clear her throat. She couldn't deal with any of that. There were a couple of times towards the end where... We managed to get her to lean forward and cough, but she wasn't really there. She was so far out of consciousness, consciousness that there was, it was almost involuntary. And when she did cough, it was a very wheezing thing. But she went into this death rattle sound, which again is a lot of fluid in the lungs that she just can't get out. And so it sounds like what you would imagine, like somebody who's unable to get the fluid out of their lungs and yet their lungs keep moving in and out. And throughout this, you know, I, I've never been an EMT, but I've always kind of been interested in first aid and, and being able to give aid to people that are around me and that I love and that I want to take care of and so forth, people I work with and whatnot. I've, so I've tried to stay current in first aid and, and through that, I think about, you know, where your pulse is and try to learn how to find the person's pulse quickly and easily and, and count it and, and try to assess what that means and, and so forth. Um, and so throughout the night I was taking her pulse on her wrist and throughout this this uh, rattling breath period, I continued to do that. Um, I think her pulse went up to maybe 120 or so. Her body was doing everything it could to just continue to breathe. And strange things start to happen. You know, her her body, as, uh, as it was coming to an end, as her body was shutting down, her extremities became, you know, they started to lose color. It became a little white, a little pale, a little yellowish. Um, and she began to do less and less movement. And you could see only, only a little bit of color in her face, but not much. And towards the very end, as she was taking her final breaths, basically that, um, that color was all gone. And it became pretty obvious pretty quickly that that's it. She's done. She's gone. I took her pulse on her jugular as well as on her wrist and my family my mom wasn't sure that she was gone thought she might still be there because her jaw kept opening and closing but I've seen enough 
uh, resuscitation videos and taken enough C um, CPR classes to understand what that what that means when a person's chest is not rising and falling but their jaw is opening and closing in that manner and I knew that that meant she was gone that that was a muscle spasm more or less that uh, it doesn't represent her breathing or trying to breathe or being conscious in any form at that point I recognized it quickly and I said no she's gone the entire family was there and this is when the really heartbreaking times came it was really really difficult to hear and to listen to and be part of everybody cried everyone held each other all my siblings my wife everyone's spouse was all there there's one other thing to share with you guys about this experience it's I want to emphasize the love that me and my family all have for one another and how tight we are in that regard to watch one of us go was very difficult but for me for my faith for what I believe I don't I don't look at my sister as permanently gone I don't look at her as completely departed never to be seen from or heard from again and just you know a lump of flesh that's just going into a grave now I don't see her that way at all I don't think of death that way at all I didn't feel that way with my dad I don't feel that way with her death isn't the end of things as far as I'm concerned it's almost a beginning in a sense it's the end of one little one little trip beginning of a much longer one frankly it gives me incredible peace to, to think about my family in that sense to think about my own existence in that sense um, the, the existence of my children think about that because my mom had to say goodbye to her daughter her first daughter but she recalled to me the, the time when she realized she was pregnant and that she hoped it would be a girl didn't know it would be and then then her, she then she was born and how how thrilled she was to have her and, you know all the all the all the feelings that I have for my daughter right now she felt for hers for my sister and there isn't much that you can tell a parent to console them um, when they've lost their child there isn't much you could tell me to console me except for the fact that I believe I'll see my kids again said you know and that I believe my mom will see her daughter again but I think I'll see my dad again I don't have any doubt about those things Guys, there are a lot of things in life that I'll generally keep kind of close to the chest because they are very personal and very meaningful and sacred to me. And I just don't want to put them out there for every internet troll to poke and prod at. But there are other things that, honestly, we're all going to experience. I don't know if one of you are going to be helped by this video. I don't know if a lot of people will be helped by this video. But I do want to let you guys know that I believe there's a lot more to existence than just this life we have on Earth. This short, short period we have here. I feel like there's a lot more uh, that we will all experience. And that gives me peace knowing that my sister's not gone forever. My dad's not gone forever. Those kind of relationships don't go away. This will be about the most personal, most vulnerable video I've ever shared with you guys. Do with it what you will. Thanks for watching.